Hi. I want to start today with um, uh, the beginning of a story that I really, really love. So on a day in June, quite a long time ago, a guy called Dwayne Jackson boarded a flight from London to Atlanta. And he lands and he gets off the plane and he heads to the, you know, he does the whole queuing at immigration thing. And he heads to the carousel to collect his bag that he checked in at Heathrow Airport. His bag arrives and he grabs it. And then he heads to where most people go to, which is the nothing to declare lane. And then about halfway through, he hears the voice of what could only be a customs officer. And that man says, step this way, please. So they go and the man checks uh, Dwayne's bag, suitcase, and it's totally clean and everything is fine. But it's actually his shoulder bag that he's worried about. And he really wants his shoulder bag to disappear. But of course it doesn't. The, the officer notices it and he opens it and inside he finds this bottle of talcum powder. And he op opens the bottle of talcum powder and, and Dwayne describes like clouds of talcum powder and just like a ton and a ton of ecstasy tablets. And then the, the officer finds a portable speaker and he dismantles it and he finds, you know, jackpot, like thousands and thousands upon thousands of ecstasy tablets, six and a half thousand to be exact. This was in 1999. Today, Dwayne is by any standard a very successful entrepreneur. But how that, I'm going to get to how that happened a bit later. I just want to stop here for a second and um, explain why and how I met with Dwayne. Um, for the last three years, my sort of partner in crime, Alexa, and I have been submerged in the dark um, and illegal world of deviant innovation, trying to convince people that there's actually a lot that we can learn from people who operate on the darker side of the economy. Uh, people, you know, the misfits, the gangsters, the hackers, um, the con artists, the uh, pirates, uh, the ex-prisoners. Uh, the sort of people who inhabit a different world, really, a world that conventional wisdom will tell you ha should have nothing to do with your own. But what we found was that, you know, rather than being just deviants who pose, you know, these threats to our well-being and threats to our social and economic stability, um, they are pioneering these new ways of thinking and doing that we can apply to and that we can learn that, that we can learn from and in from our collection of stories we found that uh, most misfits have this uh, they have a certain confidence um, a, a questioning ability and and a refusal to accept uh, the way that things are and in the, the fact is is that they weren't just outsiders they were creative outsiders. So many of them were very talented and, and adaptable, and um, most importantly, they were alert to the world around them. And now, this is going to sound like a little bit of a tangent, but I'm, please bear with me. While this research was taking place, I became obsessed with this book of essays by a 16th century uh, French essayist and philosopher, uh, Michel de Montaigne. And I couldn't help but see all these connections between what he wrote and what I was hearing from the misfits who were relaying the stories of their lives. And so Michel de Montaigne is actually a, um, they consider the greatest essayist of all time. Actually, he invented the essay, so the art of self-reflection on paper. And his insightful observations interrogated and unveiled everything, everything from friendship to loss and fear and solitude and uh, regrets. And he even had this essay on the importance of thumbs. And he's actually considered the godfather of blogging. That's what he's called as today. And the beauty of his essays was that each of them were like this personal muse on, on an act or a behavior or an occurrence. And they questioned the world that lay before him as he experienced it. Now, one of the most kind of pertinent um, pieces of advice that I took from his work is, is one that kind of still rings out through the mind. Through, 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 the, through the centuries as a mantra, and that's pay attention. And, you know, before I started reading his work, I thought, well, that, yeah, that's kind of just like, you know, when you're watching the news, you really, you really listen, or when your friend is talking, you're listening to what that person is saying. But actually, from Montagna, I learned that it goes much deeper than that. Um, it's about thinking objectively, stepping back and really examining your own actions, Actions that have become so hardwired into our motherboard and so ingrained in our lives that we rarely question them. And Montaigne used to make lists of cultures that were wildly different to his own. Cultures that made him consider how his habits 
how his behaviors might be perceived by people who were totally alien to his society. So he became fascinated with the uncivilized tribes of the Americas, where um, women would, would we um, standing and men would we sitting, and would you would wipe your bum by attaching uh, the sponge from a stick uh, to a stick, and uh, where the preferred hairstyle was to wear your hair long at the front and short at the back, and where kids were breastfed until they were 12. And, you know, the thing is, is that these leaps of perspective really challenged him to examine the habits that were carrying him throughout his life and that had become second nature to him. So his thought was, well, if I think their habits are weird, where the opposite is true. They must think that my habits are weird. And you see, the thing is, is that if, if you're anything like me, you often unconsciously go through life very comfortably entrenched in habit, you know, failing often um, to experience situations how others might experience them. But in talking to misfits, we found that they have this incredible ability not just to, to, to question the world around them and say, you know, this isn't okay, but more importantly, to question their own behavior. And at this point, I just want to go back to Dwayne Jackson, who you heard about earlier, to a time well before he found himself um, in deep trouble at an airport security office. So he, uh, Dwayne grew up uh, with an often absent mother. Um, when he was 11 years old, um, she remarried and he was sent into care. He had a very unstable, very uncertain childhood. He was moving from children's home to children's home all throughout his teens, all throughout London's East End. And a, a kind of a conventional future never really seemed, on the, you know, seemed to appear on the cards for him. But then a child psychologist concluded in, in a report that this guy was either going to be a master criminal or really amazingly successful in business. So this kind of became like the foreshadowing of a future that he was yet to shape, but obviously not immediately. In his late teens, um, he fell in with the middle manager of a drug trafficking ring and struggling to pay his bills and his rent and also a 400-pound debt to his mom, uh, he agreed to traffic drugs from England to the United States. So after a very brief but horrifying spell in a U.S. prison, he returns to England where he would serve out a sentence and he was in prison for two and a half years. And Dwayne tells me that it was in this prison where he would have what a lot of people would call an awakening moment, a moment where he would abandon the subconscious inertia that led him to the point where he would say, yes, I will traffic these drugs. And the moment uh, he, he, he called it Mushroom Gate. And he really likes mushrooms, and he would look forward to every Saturday night in the prison where they would serve kind of a traditional British fry-up for dinner, which includes mushrooms. And he was a popular guy, so the kitchen would put 10 mushrooms aside for him rather than the standard allocation of four per prisoner. One night, someone notices it, and the prison officer that was on duty at the time was particularly nasty and got really upset and cut him back to four mushrooms and also threatened to take his job in the prison, which was as an orderly, and that came with all sorts of privileges. So Dwayne said that this was a really big deal, not, not because of the mushrooms, but because of what the experience signified for him. He says that he remembers going back to his cell that night and thinking, how is it possible that this prison officer has all of this power over me? She gets to decide where I sleep that night and who my cellmate is and what my job is and, and, and how many mushrooms I have on my plate. And he remembers asking himself one question, which is, you know, how did I end up here? And he told me that this wasn't a rhetorical question. His answer to that question was, well, because I traffic drugs. And I bounced around with no plan, and this is where I am now, and I'm here because of my own actions. And in the act of asking and answering that question at this particular point in time, he started to pay attention. He turned off the autopilot, and he said that he would begin to live with intention and to break away from the tide that had led him to places that he didn't necessarily want to be in. But what was interesting in speaking to him is that it wasn't this kind of pivot alone that would play this transformative role in, in what was next to come in his life. There was an instinctive persistence, an instinctive hustle that had been honed um, throughout his troubled existence. One thing I haven't told you about him is that he's an extremely talented computer programmer. In one of the children's homes that he was living in, he noticed an old ZX computer in the corner gathering dust, and he found the manual, he turned it on, and he starts coding. 
and he loves it, and he's good at it. And, and he loves it not just because it's challenging, but because with computers, he finds a degree of certainty and consistency and lack of, lack of ambiguity that was missing from all other aspects of his life. And he tells me that he's obsessed with coding and that he never stops, not even while incarcerated. And instead of prison being this place that would stunt his development, it, was, it would actually be the place where he would hone very important skills and perspective. Now, he told me, for instance, that in prison you notice every little thing around you because you have so much time to observe your environment. He said 90% of the time in prison is bloody boring. So you become really good at noticing everything, every little detail, and every little detail takes on additional meaning. So he told me, for instance, how you can make hot baked beans on toast uh, by cutting a plastic bottle in half and filling it with water and putting the tin in there and connecting the mains lead from a stereo, and how you can toast the bread using the metal mesh wires from underneath um, prison mattresses. So, you know, a plastic bottle isn't just a plastic bottle, and metal under your mattress isn't just metal under your mattress, but actually these are ways to cook a meal. And he applied this philosophy to his life in prison without access to a computer, um, he coded with pen and paper. He would send the code to his uh, colleague on the outside, um, and they would debug that code over the phone. And in this way, he built and maintained chat rooms for clients uh, and built email scripts. You know, MailChimp wasn't around at the time. Um, and he found these experiences invaluable after he left prison. Once released, he starts his own business, working as a freelance web developer, and he stumbles into this problem that so many freelancers have. He can't find a simple way to organize his invoices that doesn't involve um, tons of spreadsheets and tons of Word documents. So he kind of takes stock and he stops and he says, you know, what's going on here? Can I create something better? And the business model in the software industry at the time was to sell software that was for the desktop. Um, but the thing is, is that Dwayne's a web developer and he doesn't have the ability to develop for a desktop. Uh, and he also didn't have the money to hire desktop developers. So what he did was that he looked around him and he noticed the detail and he used the tools that were at his disposal. He said, I have web hosting space and I have the ability to program online. So instead of building a competing um, desktop program, he built his own accounting platform online, so people would go in and put their username and their password on the cloud. And this is 2005. The cloud was not the kind of thing that it is today. So by paying attention, by making do, Duane avoided following the habits of the herd. At the time, companies were charging $1,000 a pop for software and then charging extra for customer support. But Duane's model for his business was to charge a small monthly fee and then give customer support away for free. Does that sound kind of familiar? This is pretty much the way in which we experience almost everything on the internet. We pay a monthly fee and we listen to music on Spotify and we watch TV on Netflix and we write our notes on Evernote and we put our website up on Squarespace. You know, to me, the beauty of this whole thing is that he inadvertently arrived at this way of doing things 10 years ago. And by virtue of his life experience, he was an early pioneer of this new business model that wasn't on the menu at the time. You know, by 2013, he was employing 40 people. Uh, he had revenues of two million pounds, um, and he was providing the software accounting uh, 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 platform for uh, up to 20,000 startups. And in that same year, in October, he announced that it was acquired by a, by a large company for what I can only imagine is uh, not an insubstantial amount of money. So the fascinating thing to me is that um, Duane's experiences as a misfit enabled his later achievements. They helped him to reframe his uh, perspective, to cultivate a resolve that would allow him not just to uh, pay attention and not just to change direction, but to do so with intention and resourcefulness. And I love this anecdote. He told me that he'd rather hire a guy, a 25-year-old, who's um, just been to prison, for two years and wants to start a business, rather than a guy who's just finished a university degree and wants to start a business. The former, he said, has had a lot of time to think, and he still wants to start a business. You know, he means it. It's not because, hey, that's kind of a cool thing to do. 
In closing our conversation, um, Dwayne said something that really struck me uh, about his, the role of prison in his life. And he said, at no other point in your life do you get the opportunity to press pause for two years and think about where you are and how you got there. And I was lucky that I had that opportunity, he said. I was lucky. And the thing is, we don't have to wait to, to, to be thrown into prison or be dragged into desperate circumstances to choose how we derive meaning from experience. Uh, even without a spell of incarceration, we can take a step back and assess the behaviors and the actions that are carrying us through our lives. And we can, like Montagna did, observe the cultures of others, you know, including misfits, in order to develop a perspective that will help us to question the processes and the habits and, and the thoughts that have become so second nature and so automatic. And when we do this, and when we pay attention, we might be able to realize that it's actually the people who we least expect to be our teachers who actually end up teaching us the most. Thank you.